This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is NASCAR Hall of Fame driver and television analyst, Daryl Waltrip. After capturing three NASCAR points championships, taking the checkers in the Daytona 500, and retiring as one of the sport's greatest drivers, I'm sure somebody shouted to Daryl Waltrip, hey, DW, what do you do for an encore? Must be awfully hard for anyone successful and famous to lead one career and become just as successful at another. But that's exactly what Waltrip has done. The animated, anything but shy personality of DW has made him a natural to talk NASCAR on the Fox Network telecasts. He has become one of the most entertaining analysts in sports and has carved out that rare second career. Today, I head into victory lane with one of the most popular and successful drivers in the history of NASCAR, Daryl Waltrip, ahead on Sports Files. Daryl, thank you so much for being with us. It's an honor. Uh, we, we appreciate to have come somebody to like town yourself. To get this award. Uh, I mean, this is like winning the Daytona 500 right here. It is pretty neat. The Distinguished Citizen Award presented by the AutoZone Liberty Bowl. Yeah. When you got the call, what was it? You know, here's, here's a football bowl game honoring one of the great NASCAR drivers of all time. That, that's what made it sort of like me. Because, <laughs> I, you know, when I looked at the list, when they told me who had won, the, won this award before, I said, I don't see any NASCAR drivers on there. I don't see any NASCAR personalities on there. So that was that made it even that much more special for me to be kind of like the first NASCAR personality to, to receive this very distinguished award. Uh, the people that won it before me, uh, it's amazing. And I, I'm honored. Uh, you never know. You, you just never know when you, when, when you retire from one career what, what the future holds. Exactly. And I've been blessed to have two careers. And that's kind of what this award's all about. Uh, you know, it transcends what you've done all your life or what you're known for. I'm known for putting on a helmet and driving a car. And now I'm known for putting on a coat and a tie and holding a <laughs> microphone. So I've been blessed. Speaking of awards, last year, just your honors and your third year of eligibility, you're elected to the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Yeah. Of all the honors, of all the great accomplishments after racing from what you did in your career, is that the pinnacle? Yeah, it is. Uh, that's the ring, the Hall of Fame ring, and and what makes what makes any Hall of Fame special for every athlete that's inducted into any Hall of Fame is, it's for us it's voted on by your peers. There are 50 uh, men that go into a room, and they look at the uh, that the work you've done, uh, your what, what have you contributed, uh, what kind of results have you gotten, uh, and they look at a lot of different criteria to decide who's going to get into the Hall of Fame. And they vote on it. And there are people in that room that I've had to drive, race against that right. don't, don't necessarily like you. There are media people in there that don't necessarily agree with you. There's NASCAR officials that you've had disagreements with. But at the end of the day, when they say your Hall of Fame uh, material and uh, you get inducted in the Hall of Fame, it, it, it's like icing on the cake. You invest, you invest, invest. That's what a career is. It's an investment. You put in the time. You put in the work. You put in the effort and you get the results and at the end of your career hopefully those numbers all add up and people agree that you deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. It's, it's as good as it gets. You have been one of the lucky ones to have this illustrious career after getting out of the race car yeah. and as you said getting behind the microphone yeah. and in front of the camera but how hard was it DW when you first got out of the car for good? Was it something that really bothered you, I want to get back, I miss it, or were you able to get out of it and say, okay, I'm moving on? Yeah, I, I couldn't just walk away. I, I ran a few uh, special races. I, I drove in a few of the uh, Camping World Truck Series races uh, at Martinsville, Indianapolis, some of the small racetracks, drove a nationwide race. Couldn't quite let go of it totally. Was that kinda, because of the competitive juices? Yeah, just, in you? but they had to have those slow. They had to have a little withdrawal, you know. Right. <laughs> uh, when that's from the time I was 12 years old, for about 40 years of my life, every Sunday of my life, I got up and put a helmet on mm. and raced somewhere. That was a hard habit to break, 
And so it, 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 was, it really was difficult in the beginning to stand up there on the other side of the fence and watch guys do what I'd done my whole life. Uh, that was hard to adjust to. But in the end, with, you know, with my wife, uh, we've been married 44 years. We have two beautiful kids. Thank you. I have two beautiful kids. And uh, it was time for me to, to give back something to them. And I couldn't have a better job. The TV deal for us is pretty cool. We work half a year, and then we're off. And somebody else does the second half of the year. Right. And so I always told Stevie, I said, you know, I'll pay you back for all those 30 years sitting on a <laughs> toolbox. At 30 years and a half a year at a time, it's going to take me 60 years to get back even. But anyway, I'm making an effort toward it, and, uh, and, and I'm so thrilled with what I get to do. Well, you've really carved out a niche for yourself with your style. Did it come naturally? Uh, well, there are people that have accused me of talking too much. And there are, you know, my nickname was Jaws. And uh, there's a number of reasons for that uh, because I talked a lot. Yeah, we're not talking the fish, right? No, 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 no. We're talking, <laughs> we're talking the big Jaws. Uh, and, and so, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it was rather easy for me. I had a lot of experience. I grew, I, I've been in Nashville for over 40 years. Ralph Emery was a really good friend of mine. I did a lot of late night radio shows on WSM with Ralph. Oh, okay. Nashville Now was a huge success on TNN, what was it, the Nashville uh, Network back uh, some years ago. Right. I got to host the show a number of times, and it's a live show, so what you see is what you get. I did a lot of celebrity appearances, uh, you know, with other networks, calling races. So I, I had some experience. I knew what I was getting into. But I tell you, it, it's where you're sitting, that's the hardest job. Where I'm sitting, this is what I do. I can, you can interview me, you can ask me one question, and you can just, I, I pretty well got Sit it. Sit back there. and you got it, right? But sitting over there, that was one, having those notes, mm -hmm. thinking of those questions to ask that guy, something that, that will reveal something about that guy that nobody ever, that he had never said before, or, or a side to a guy that people had never seen before. That's the hard job, bringing out that interview. And sitting where you are, it's the hardest thing I've ever had to do. I love doing it. I like the challenge. Right. But it's a totally different situation when you're being interviewed and when you're the interviewer. Well, this next question, I didn't have to do much homework on it, and it is a repetitive question. I'm sure you've heard it a million times, but where did the catchphrase come from? <laughs> well, it's really not that complicated. Uh, one, of, one of the things that, uh, uh, as a driver, a former driver, one of the most important parts, one of the most exciting parts of the race, one of the most exhilarating parts of the race is the start. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I listen to these other announcers and other analysts, and it, the cars would be coming off turn four to get to green. They say, and the green flag is in the air. <laughs> I said, you got to be kidding me. That's all, up. that's all there is? Right. I mean, the driver's in there. His heart's racing. His palms are sweating. He's getting ready to go to war. And the guy says, and the green flag is in the air. So I said, it's got to be a better, it's got to be something better than that. And so I was listening to a Ray Stevens song, The Streak. You probably heard it. I know The Streak. Yeah. Here he comes, boogity boogity. There he goes. That's it. That's it. That's it. Here he comes, boogity boogity boogity. And there he goes. Let's go racing, boys and girls. And uh, and you know I threw it out there one Sunday just for fun, because it it just seemed like a fun way to start a race. Well, it stuck, and and people won't let go of it. I can go in any restaurant, from New York to California, and when I walk in, for somebody in there that's ever seen me on TV or knows me at all, I always hearing about. Hey, D.W., give us a boogity, boogity, boogity. <laughs> like, and, and one of my buddies said, how does it feel to be more famous for boogity, 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 let's go racing, boys, than it does to be a three-time champion with 84 wins? Well, at this point in my life, it feels pretty good. Feels darn good. Feels good. You mentioned the three points championships. Bigger accomplishment in your career to get the Daytona 500 win or any of the three championships? Yeah, it, it, it's really, it's like this award. Uh, it, it's the sum of all the parts. Uh, you know, to, to, to be in the Hall of Fame uh, and to won those championships and, and have those wins. If, if the Daytona 500 wasn't one of them, uh, you feel like your career was incomplete. Right. It, it, it's the pinnacle. Uh, it's, it's the biggest race we have. It's the one with all the big names that are attached to it. And so, you know, when you look at your resume, when you look at what you've done, hopefully, I only won it once, but that's all I ever asked for. Just let me win it once. And uh, my name's on that list, and so that's a big accomplishment. The 
icky shuffle after you won. Was it was it improv or was this something you were thinking to yourself? If I win this race, I'm going to do it because he was hot at the time. He it was, didn't last was. long, yeah. but it was hot at the time. Well, he was. It was funny because people were doing all, you know, again, victory circle. You talk about the exhilarating start, but then the, then the finish of the race. And you're standing in victory circle with your family, your friends, your team. I mean, that's a big moment. And sure. I, I just don't, I just, I, I think it needs to be, I, I want it to be exciting. And I want it to feel like it did a, that was my 80, 80th some win, I guess. I wanted it to, I wanted that 80th win to be just as exciting as that first one was in 1975. And so it's a celebration. Victory Lane is a celebration. And, and you want it to be memorable. And, and again, I don't want to be considered a goofball. You know, I just want to be considered a guy that has fun and loves what he does. And that icky shuffle thing, it came to me because I'd seen him do it. And that was when, I don't think there was, a lot of guys doing uh, end zone celebrations. No, I no, think he may have been no. one of the very first. The, the NFL, no fun league they were calling it. Oh, yeah. He came out and made it interesting. You're right, you got to have fun with whatever yeah, you're doing. Yeah, and so, uh, so I had that in the back of my mind. And, uh, and when I got out of the car, <laughs> I had told, we were down testing a few weeks before, and the guy said, you've never won the race. What would you do if you ever won? And I said, it will be memorable. And it is. I, well, it will be memorable. I don't know. I might strip down and go run out in the Lake <laughs> Lloyd. I'm not sure, but it'll be memorable. Anyone who has a brother, anyone who has a sister, there's always some type of sibling rivalry. Uh, your little brother getting two Daytona 500 wins. They yeah. say, yeah, yeah, you know, I got three points championships. And, and Michael comes back, I got two Daytona 500 <laughs> wins. Yeah, well, uh, Mikey is a great restrictor plate racer. When it comes to Daytona and Talladega, even today, he just finished fifth at uh, – uh, Daytona back in July here in the 4th of July race. Uh, he could have won the Talladega race. Tony Stewart cut him off and they wrecked. Uh, but my brother, for whatever reason, uh, he has a real knack. They always said Dale Earnhardt could, could see the air. Well, we all know you don't see air, but I, I know you can feel air. And I think my brother just has a kind of a sixth sense about where to put his car, how to get in the right position to get the best result. And uh, I'd put him up against anybody on a restrictor play track. Me, uh, I was just mediocre, uh, but him, he's one of the best. DW, best driver today, best driver of all time. It might be the same guy, uh, Jimmy Johnson. Wow. Uh, and by far and away the best driver of our of this era. Uh, and and it's, what makes him so good? Well, I, th it's, I think it's his commitment. He is so dedicated. He doesn't have any other. This, this driving that race car, winning races, winning championships, five. Five championships, five in a row. That's Pretty nobody incredible. else has ever done that. He just swept Daytona, February, July. It'd been 31 years since anybody had done that. He's doing things that people back in the 60s and 70s did. He's breaking records, tying records that have been there for a long, long time. Uh, he's with has a great crew chief, Chad Canals. They they communicate well. They believe in each other. They trust each other, and the the results are phenomenal. This man has 64 wins. And he, he's never, he's finished out of the top five in points one time <laughs> in, in the last 10 years. So uh, he's just a committed guy. This is what he does, and he does it to perfection. I always tell all the other people, I said, why don't you just watch what he does and try to emulate that? Model yourself after him. I mean, he doesn't have any other hobbies. You don't hear about him going and playing golf. You don't hear about him uh, uh, car dealerships. You don't hear about him going fishing. All you hear about, he's in the gym, focusing on the next race. Monday morning, he wins the race on Sunday afternoon. Monday morning, he's in the gym working. That's how dedicated this guy is. There's a, there's a lot to be said, and he's a great role model if you, want to get, if you want to do something and do it right. In about a minute, give me the major differences other than the purses, the money they're making today, and the car itself. Major differences between when you drove and now. Yeah, well, back... Back when I drove, you drove by the seat of your pants. You were the only, everything that the team knew about that race car came from the driver. Everything that needed to be done to that race car came from the driver. Driver gets in the car, driver goes on the track, car's doing this, car's doing that, change this, change that, fix this, fix that. So the driver was the onboard computer. Today, the driver just drives. There's so much technology. We had no technology. Right. You know, we, did, we had a pencil and a, and a pad and, and me and me and Hammond to get down on the ground and draw it out in the sand. And now these guys, I mean, they have all the all the technology in the world. They have onboard computers that gives them back data that they can look at after practice during. They can't look at it during the race, but during practice, qualifying, 
throttle traces, brake traces, steering input, brake input, things that I had to tell my team that these drivers now, they just have to, yeah, that's right, the, the, the data is correct. <laughs> Big Our, difference. DW, uh, you're off the hot seat, but not quite done the interview. We like to end every interview, and find out a little bit more about our guests called Five for the Road. So give me a first thing that comes to mind with these five quick questions for you. Okay. What is your favorite professional sports team of all time? Of all time? Uh, I guess the Boston Celtics. The Celtics? Yeah. Well, mainly, I know you were in the Nashville area. I thought yeah. you might go Titans. Right? No, 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 no. <laughs> don't, don't put words in my mouth. Okay? No, 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 no. But I tell you why. I've always been a, kind of like the Boston Celtics. And you'll love this. A long time ago, Carl Ustremski. Oh, sure, yes. And her mom would, at the World Series, I'll never forget. And she wasn't a big sports fan. But she was hollering at Ustremski. They hit a home run. <laughs> and so I've always liked the Red Sox. I've always liked uh, the Celtics. And, and the reason I like Celtics is because Coach Patino. I, I, Coach Patino, I, I'm a big fan of his, and when he coached the Celtics, I know it didn't work out too hot. Right, but it's uh, working out at Louisville. But it's it Fa is. favorite pro athlete of all time. Oh, I don't know. You can I go think. driver too. Yeah, no, there's a lot of guys that, that fall into that category. I think um, uh, Roger Staubach. Roger Staubach. Yeah. Favorite music or or a, a band, a oh, group. Man. Country music. Country music. Yeah. Who would it be? What artist? Oh, I, I love the old guys. You know, I, I, George Jones was a the really late George good Jones. friend of mine. He just passed away. Right. Uh, I don't know. Vern Godson was a good friend of mine. Martina McBride. Uh, Winona Judd. Uh, it's, all, it's country. It, it's all country. Okay. And there's a lot of young guys. I, I mean, my wife loves Blake Shelton. And, and she's not a big country. So does my music. wife. She's not a big country music fan, but she knows every word to <laughs> boys around here. There you go. I caught her in the barn. I went up to the barn. She was cleaning the barn, and, and she had the radio turned up, and Blake was on, and she was singing that song, and she knew every word to it. Boys around here. She was. <laughs> Real quick, favorite uh, movie of all time? Oh, remember the Titans. Favorite TV show of all time? Oh. TV series. <laughs> This is really bad. Don't say hee haw. <laughs> uh, I, I love Mayberry. <laughs> there you go. Mayberry RFD. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, I like Wapner, too. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. DW, what a pleasure. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. The name Doolin is synonymous with baseball in Memphis in the Mid-South. Tim Doolin is a former professional baseball player in the Orioles organization and a standout at then Memphis State. For years, Tim, through his Doolin's Dodgers, has helped develop countless numbers of players, many of whom have moved on to college and some who have made it to the pro ranks. Dalton Doolin, Tim's son, is a chip off the old block. He is headed to Ole Miss in the fall after a standout prep career at MUS and with the Dodgers. He has captured countless honors, including being named to this year's World Woodbat 18 and Under All-Tournament Team. And he looks to one day play on the big stage. Recently, I had a chance to chat with Dalton, who I found to be just as engaging as he is talented. Well, Dalton, let's, uh, let's first of all talk about Ole Miss. You start in the fall. How excited are you to play for Mike Bianco? I'm really excited. Um... I'm really excited to get down to Oxford. Uh, my sister graduated from there this past year, so uh, I've, I've been kind of going down there and hanging out with her a little bit. But uh, I grew up with a bunch of guys who, who graduated from there, Zach Cozart, mm -hmm. uh, Drew Pomerantz, Cody Overbeck, and those guys played in my dad's organization. So uh, they kind of took me in as their little brother. And uh, the coaching staff, they, they welcomed me as, as I was a family member. And, that's just, that's just where it went from. So with that said, was it an easy decision? It, it, it was. It was an easy decision. Um, I've been going down there since I was probably 10, and just they welcomed me in the locker room like I was a player, um, a teammate. So uh, I felt comfortable there with the coaching staff, and it was an easy decision. And um, I just felt like I, I should get it out of the way because that's what I knew what I wanted to do. That was the easy decision. The hard decision came a couple of months ago with the baseball amateur draft. Your pick in the 36th round by the team I grew up with, the Philadelphia Phillies. You're coming out of MUS. You're thinking about, old, you've already signed with Ole Miss. Did you really contemplate it going professional? Right, right, I did. Um, and really the, the showcase year was last year, uh, my, my junior year summer. And uh, I, I, was, I was on the road all summer long, showcasing, uh, doing, all that, doing all that kind of stuff. And, um, so I got drafted with the Phillies and uh, I knew it was gonna get down to the wire um, with the deadline. 
Um, and I mean, I've always had uh, dreams to play in the big leagues, and I, I still have those dreams. And um, the Phillies had flown in when it was getting down to the wire, and they watched me work out. And uh, we were trying to get a deal done, but it just didn't happen. And um, I'm really excited about my opportunity at Ole Miss. You're following in your father's footsteps as a middle infielder, primarily second base. You're a switch hitter. Tell everybody about uh, a little bit more about what you bring to the game. Uh, what I bring to the game, let's see. Uh, first of all and foremost, I'm a winner and uh, I'm, I'm a great teammate. Um, I know how to win and with, with that, it comes responsibility and, and to lead, uh, to be a leader on a team, on a high caliber team, you, you can't be the guy up there bossing everybody around. You gotta be the leader and you gotta be in the front of the pack guiding, showing people what to do. I mean, that's what a leader does. So um, I, I feel like I'm a lead off hitter. Um, I use gap to gap power to drive the ball to the, all parts of the ballpark. Uh, I get on first base and I'm looking to steal second and third as soon as I can and, and rely on my teammates to, to get me in and put some runs up on the board. What was it like to grow up as a little tot in a baseball household with, with your father, Tim, having played professional? Did you start right away as a little guy? Oh yeah, I'm sure I did. My mom shows me pictures constantly. And um, just growing up, growing up in the, in the Duel and Dodger organization, it's, it's humbled me and I've seen a bunch of big leaguers uh, come, come through the system and I see how they carry themselves and, and I try to model myself after them. Yeah, and for those who don't know, and they should know in this area what the Duel and Dodgers is all about, but perennial national championship contenders, you win so many tournaments around the country, you did so again earlier this summer, you play both aluminum bat tournaments, wooden bat tournaments, so I get you ready for both the collegiate level, the professional level, just a, a standout organization. And you got to be humble because that's your pop that's right. running the show. Of course, yeah. I mean, you, you, you have to carry yourself and, uh, as a professional. And I've learned that since I was a, uh, since I was a tot. And um, just, just being around these big leaguers and seeing, seeing the way they play the game and how they are on and off the field, you kind of you have no choice. You, you just fall right into the mold. And, um, and that's what they expect of you. And, and we don't, I don't really cross the line with my parents. I would imagine there's a disagreement or two when it comes to the game of baseball. What's the one area maybe your, your, your dad's saying, look, you got to do this. And you say, no, I, I think I'm OK. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's constantly, there's constantly arguments. And, and they, don't really, they don't really get heated or anything like that. But baseball is constantly on at my house 24-7. Um, whether it's watching my god brother uh, Julio Bourbon with the Cubs right. on TV. Um, but yeah, we're constantly just going over things. What would you do in this situation? Going through pitch counts and just, just little things with, with your swing and, and defensively on the field and just, just things like that. Was there ever a worry growing up? Here are your buddies, you know, some are playing baseball, maybe some are doing something else. Ah, I don't have time to go out with you guys because I'm playing baseball. Did you were ever worried that there could be a burnout factor? Oh yeah, of course. I mean that that's always that's always in the back of your mind. And um, with me, I, I really keep a tight circle. Um, I, I'm friendly with everybody. I, I have all kind of friends. But um, at the same at the same reason, same point, you can't you can't get off track because as soon as you get off track is when is when you stop looking at the main goal. Right. And so with me, that wasn't really a factor. Um, I mean, playing baseball all summer long, you don't have a choice. So that's really all we did, and baseball is my life. What is the one area of the game itself, hitting, running, fielding, throwing, that you want to work on a little bit more? Um, see, I hit naturally left-handed. And so when I was probably 13 to 14 years old, I started hitting right-handed, started switching. And so, of course, that's going to be your weakest, that's going to be your weakest part of the game. But um, growing up and maturing and just taking thousands of swings right-handed, it's gotten me more fluent and um, it's, it's getting there. And um, just that's the, main, that's the main point I've been working on. But um, just, just all around, everything in the field, hitting, you just you got to keep working. Was that something that you came up with that you wanted to try switch hitting or did your dad recommend it? Uh, my dad, he, he, he kind of lays back about that kind of stuff. I mean, um, I'm self-motivated and, and, and uh, that's, that's really how it goes. And, and just watching big leaguers and and I've only seen a very few uh, amount of baseball players that can actually switch it. So I figured if, if some of these guys can do it, why can't I? One final question for you. Other than the actual games itself, which won't be until the spring, you're getting ready for fall ball. What's the one thing you are looking forward to the most about going down to Oxford and going to school at Ole Miss and playing baseball? Yeah, I'm really excited to get down to Oxford. And, and um, I've had a guy live with me from West Palm for about three years now. And he's one of the top pitchers in the country, right-handed pitcher. And so um, really the recruiting class that, that Coach Bianco, he's put together for this 2014 uh, season. I'm really excited to get down there and, and uh, play with these guys. And the main goal is to win. And 
try to get to Omaha. Hey, continued success. We've enjoyed watching you play as a prep player, playing obviously with the travel team, with Doolins. And now we look forward to watching you at Ole Miss and eventually Dalton professional baseball. That's right. I appreciate it. Best of luck. Thank you. The Grizzlies made a move this week, acquiring the rights to former Florida Gators point guard Nick Calathis. Calathis has played four seasons overseas and has a year left on his current deal with the team in the Russian Professional League. But the deal contains an NBA out, so if terms can be agreed upon, he could be a member of the Grizzlies this year. Calathis was this past season's Euro Cup Most Valuable Player. And that'll do it for the show. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.